infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. Now, today I want to look at some different issues involving the COVID-19 pandemic to include the varying fatality rates in select countries, U.S. pandemic preparedness, and what we should be doing moving forward. Joining me to look at these issues is Senior Scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, Dr. Amos Adalja. Dr. Adalja, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Well, let me start out with this question. You know, how does this pandemic compare with the H1N1 pandemic back about 10, 11 years ago? And why are we taking such more extensive measures with this pandemic than we did 10 or 11 years ago? Well, it's important to remember that there are some similarities between flu viruses and coronaviruses, that they spread in the same manner, that they're respiratory illnesses, that they cause similar types of symptoms. And if you go back to 2009, there was a lot of concern in the early days of that pandemic about the severity, understanding how prepared we would be. However, what saved us in that pandemic was the fact that the virus wasn't very fatal, meaning it really didn't have a much more of a case fatality rate than seasonal flu did. And it was something that we could cope with. Although there were young people, the average age of death during 2009 H1N1 was considerably lower than during a seasonal flu. This was something that stressed hospitals, uh, crowded emergency departments, but the total toll wasn't enough to exceed capacity. And this virus seems to be a couple of magnitudes more dangerous, at least a couple of more magnitudes more dangerous than seasonal flu or the H1N1 virus, meaning that the case fatality ratio may be you know, somewhere between 0.5% or 1%, versus H1N1, which was around 0.1% or maybe even lower than that. And the other issue is it's not just the case fatality ratio. It's the individuals who are getting sick and requiring hospitalizations. That percentage is what's causing hospitals to be worried about their capacity. And I think that's the main issue here. That's why we're responding is because the, the sheer number of people that will get infected by this, because it's a new virus, no community immunity, and the fact that so many of the people are going to require hospitalization, that's what, this, that's what the scariest part of this pandemic is. Yeah. Um, now, I wanted to ask about uh, some pretty big disparity in fatality ratios among some different countries. And there are many examples. But one that's most stark to me is the difference, say, between Italy and Spain. Italy has about a 10% case fatality rate. Uh, versus Germany, which is seeing less than 0.5% um, and only about 200 deaths, and they have, I don't know, close to 40,000 cases. Why the big difference between these neighboring countries? And I, th I think most of Europe has a older population, too. I do think that the Italian outbreak population is older on average than in many other countries, and the average age of death, I think, is in the 80s, the last time I checked it in Italy, and it may be that that's part of it. The other issue is that we have um, an issue with bed capacity in Italy because this outbreak is concentrated in the northern part of Italy, uh, and that, that there has been some, I think, resistance to transferring those patients outside of that area, and at least from an article in Lan The Lancet that I read, that's created a really major ICU bed crunch in that Lombardy region which is going to then stress the doctors out, stress the hospitals, and you're going to see these cascading effects impacting mortality. Whereas, and I don't know the case for Germany, but it may be that they don't have that, that same capacity problem, so they're able to render the best care possible uh, to those individuals where we're hearing about in Italy that they're basically using crisis standards of care in that part of the, re in that part of the, in the country where certain people are not being admitted to the ICU or not being placed on a ventilator just based on other criteria because there's such a, a scarcity of resources. Now, you're, you're no stranger to pandemic preparedness, and you write in a recent article that the unprecedented challenge we face with COVID-19 is the predictable result of years of neglect when the biosecurity budget was less than that for the military marching bands. 
can you be a little bit more specific about this statement and what have we done wrong? Well, what we have is a cycle of panic and neglect. People have been warning against the threat of pandemics and the threat of infectious diseases and how infectious diseases might impact national security for decades. But it's not something that people have ever prioritized. And people really fail to realize what type of an impact a pandemic can have, much different than any other kind of health, health type of crisis because of this, the fact that it's contagious, the fact that it has implications for industry where you have restrictions on travel, lots of different facets of life get impacted by an infectious disease in a manner that's not similar to any other type of threat. However, because we we live in, a, in an era where we really have been free of pandemics, uh, and the only pandemic that we did have was in 2009, and it was not something that was very severe, that actually has gotten people to be very complacent. And you see there's a cycle where there is a new infectious disease threat, there may be some funding that's done reactively, and then it disappears when that threat recedes from the headlines. We saw that with Zika. We saw that with Ebola. We've seen it over and over again. And that's what I'm talking about, that we're not treating infectious diseases as part of national security. And that's why we got to where we are. We don't do this with any other aspect of national security. We have diagnostic kits at the go, uh, or the equivalent of diagnostic t- tests at the go for other national security threats. But we didn't have it for this. We didn't think about making a vaccine, having a vaccine really off the shelf for coronaviruses, even though we had been threatened with SARS in 2003 and threatened with MERS in, in 2014. Still, no vaccines for coronaviruses, still no antivirals against coronaviruses. So I do think that there is this complacency in pandemics or were not necessarily something that was high on most policymakers' uh, list because it's not something that the voters are actually clamoring for. But you can see how impactful an infectious disease outbreak can be and what a better place he would have been in if we had a coronavirus vaccine or even a coronavirus antiviral. Yeah, yeah. So what, are we, what have we done well? What I think that we, I don't think that we've done very much well with this pandemic. I think that most of it has been negative. We initially basically codified this disease as something that was travel related. If you look at the initial CDC guidance, people had to have come from China and and you couldn't test and you couldn't test uh, people with mild disease. If you put those two things together, it's not surprising that we ended up where we are because so many cases were not tested and they were still contagious and able to spread. So I don't think our our testing algorithm or the diagnostic test, which the rollout was really botched and well-established how botched that was, has done anybody any favors. Our hospitals have not been prepared. We're hearing about lots of lack of coordination at the federal level to get assets from the strategic national stockpile to hospitals that need them. Our public health communication has been bad. We've had mixed messages from, from different government agencies that are contradicting each other. That increases panic. We've not been able to... Um, we really have not been able to respond to this the way that we expected. And I think it is in contrast to H1N1, where even though it was a less severe pandemic, we didn't have actions that were wrong uh, for the most part. We had a very clear idea that this was not a containable disease, and we moved immediately to vaccine development, to hospital preparedness, and having an experimental antiviral, paramivir, available at that time. That's not been the case here. We've just basically seen delay after delay, and I think it's it really shows that that, that pandemic preparedness has eroded since that time, I would say. And uh, I, I don't really give the U.S. a good mark on most of this right now. And it, I think that we've been warning about this. We've been doing exercises on it, and people knew about the coronavirus threat at least since 2003. So I, I don't think that I can say that the United States is going to come out looking good when we when we write the, the reports on this pandemic and the lessons learned. Now, starting from this day forward, what do you see as the most potential disastrous result? The most potential disastrous result is that we have certain cities whose hospitals get inundated and their ICUs go above capacity, and we have shortages of certain vital equipment like mechanical ventilators as well as personal protective equipment, which leads hospitals in certain high struck areas to shift from normal standard of care to crisis standards of care. That would be the, the, the doomsday scenario that I would worry about, is that hospitals are unable to cope and have to make decisions about who lives and who do, who dies, not based on prognosis, but based on uh, scarcity of resources that they have to allocate. Yeah. Um, what is your view on the stay-at-home policies or the lockdown policies that are going on around the country? 
right now we, we don't have the ability to know completely where this disease is, where it isn't, who has it, who doesn't, because our diagnostic testing has been so beha been behind the eight ball. So we're forced to use basically these blunt tools of social distancing. And we know that this virus does thrive on contact between individuals. So we're left with having to social distance. And I do think it is very important that people social distance, especially those that are at, that are at increased risk for complications, the elderly, those with underlying conditions. I, I also know that there is a cost to this psychosocial distancing, especially when it's done, when it's accompanied by shutdowns of businesses. And I do think that when we look at models that look, up, look at how we control this disease, we also have to factor in the negative costs of some of these economic shutdowns and look at the long-term benefit of, this, uh, of them and try and figure out where the balance is. Can we allow some businesses to open in modified fashion? Can we find ways to kind of not do a Wuhan-type lockdown but not let this virus spread and, and kind of remove that whole false alternative that it's one or the other? I think there has to be a way to, to find a, a path through this in an exit strategy, but I do think for the time being, most of the social distancing that's going on is is going to be beneficial until we get a better idea of where this this uh, virus is. But we have to, at the same time, think about what the strategy is for when we can start to lift these social distancing measures. What are those triggers, and how do you how do you do them in a manner that doesn't allow the virus to get out of hand? Yeah. So so clearly, at least. I'm reading in between the lines. You you are concerned also about the short and long term economic effects of these government actions. I, I am concerned about the, the the economic effects, and it's not just economic effects. It's just it's the overall uh, effect on the population, the mm -hmm. psychology, other health conditions, and I, I think that has to be put into the models as well. And it's not going to be an all or none type of decision. And these aren't easy decisions. It's just something that we need to start talking about as a society about what are the thresholds for lifting some of the social distancing measures that have been imposed by governors around the, the country, and when can we do that, and how do we do it in a safe manner? Yeah. Now, there was a Oxford study, I think, that came out very recently, and they were talking that, based on their modeling, about half the UK, they predict, has already been infected. Um, and a couple, at least a couple of European countries were looking at going the herd immunity route. Uh, any thoughts on that? There's a danger of thinking about the herd immunity route in that there are going to be individuals who may end up having severe illness, especially if you cannot keep the people that you want to induce herd immunity and the young, healthy people away from those that are at higher risk. And I don't know how you keep those two compartments completely separate. So you have to do, the, do this in a very, uh, a very, um, I guess, fine-tuned manner so that you don't end up creating more of a problem. And remember, even the younger people, there are there is going to be some significant proportion of them that require hospitalization and some that may die. So you may not blunt the full force of the of the pandemic by doing that. So it has to be done in a proper manner, and I think it needs to be studied. And uh, I, I think it's it's just a, a very daunting way of, go, of going about it. Mm -hmm. But I do think right now, if there are people that are immune, if we could identify those individuals with serological tests, I think it would be. Uh, an interesting uh, way to move forward by allowing those people who are immune to basically uh, go back to work, go do things, and, and, and remove those restrictions on those who are already immune. But we need to have, again, diagnostic testing to be able to do that. But if this if this modeling is correct, and I don't know if it is or not, nobody knows, um, if half of the UK is already infected, is it already, I mean, do you think it's just like, you know, let's let it fly then? I, I don't know. I mean, I think when you, I'm always leery of models because I don't know what their assumptions are. I would want to see some real-world data. I'd want to see some sampling to look at the antibody levels and to see if that's actually the case before you would do that. Yeah. Okay. Now, in the recent article that you wrote, you you mentioned five measures we should be taking to deal with the pandemic until a vaccine is developed. Um, can you elaborate on these five measures? Sure. I think that the number one thing to remember is hospital preparedness has to be paramount. That's the big thing that we're dealing with right now. We need to make sure that our hospitals are not stretched beyond capacity and aren't forced to make decisions that nobody wants to make. And that includes having mechanical ventilators, having ICU bed capacity, having places to do alternative care sites like we're hearing about at the Jacob Javits Center and with some of the military ships coming into, into play. That also means having adequate personal protective equipment and a robust supply chain for them. And that's the, that's the first thing, that if we have to do hospital, we have to get hospital preparedness in place. The second thing is diagnostic testing. We need to do 
we need to be able to actually test for these patients at the point of care. We need to not be rationing tests anymore. We need to be able to give tests to those people who, whose doctors believe that they need a test, and that can help us guide treatment, and it can also help us identify who's recovered from this illness. We, we also need to think about expanding our healthcare workforce. We need to remove restrictions on physician assistants, nurse practitioners, uh, paramedics, pharmacists. All of those people can help us reinforce our healthcare workforce in order to, uh, to allow it to thrive. There, there's also going to be needs to, to have access to some of the experimental drugs, and we do have programs like Right to Try. I think that's something that would be important to think about mm -hmm. using when a patient and their physician believes that they might benefit from a drug that's under clinical trials, having ways to get those drugs and, and to use them. And the fifth thing was really that until some of these things are in place, that we're going to need to continue to do voluntary social distancing. We're, prob we're not going to be able to have mass gatherings uh, the way we did, and we're going to have to really try and cocoon the elderly and those at high risk uh, from infection. Yeah, and let me go ahead and close with this question. I'd like to get your thoughts on the progress that we're making in finding drugs to treat this viral infection. I do think that there is a lot of promise with the antiviral remdesivir. It's now on expanded access. There are clinical trials going on, and hopefully we'll get some data from it in the next few days or weeks to understand how, how well this works and which pa patients benefit the most from it. There has been some interest in repurposing certain other drugs like hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. It's important to remember that that needs to be studied in a randomized controlled trial or part of a hospital-based protocol, not something to self-experiment on your own. There are other drugs as well. There's an anti-influenza drug marketed in Japan called favipiravir that needs to be studied appropriately as well. And then some compounds in Emory uh, University has made that I think also are worth, worth looking at. And then there are those immune modulating drugs, some of which we use for cytokine release syndromes that happen with uh, oncology patients after they get CAR-T therapy. Those also may have a role in some of the severely ill patients who are experiencing heavy immune uh, dysfunction from the virus uh, that's causing a lot of the damage. So I think all of those are, are looking good. But remember, those are not panaceas, and those are going to be for hospitalized patients. Mm -hmm. We really need to have a vaccine to be able to control this. Well, let me ask you one last question. Is there any reason for any of us to think that, say, in 2022, there's, there's a vaccine available, and the public isn't going to treat it like the flu vaccine, and only a, a small percentage actually get the vaccine? There is a chance that people are not going to, to uptake the vaccine. You know, we've seen vaccine uptake erode all over the world, and I think that that is a concern. Hopefully, people have seen the severity of this pandemic, and they will think twice about it. But remember, back in 2009, the H1N1 vaccine had one of the lowest uptakes of any, year, any flu vaccine. Mm -hmm. So even despite the fact that there was a pandemic in 2009, it didn't really influence vaccine rates for the positive. So hopefully, people would be amenable to taking this vaccine because it's the only way that we're going to be able to control this this virus. Sure. Again, a big hopefully. And uh, I want to thank you, Dr. Amesh Adalja, for sharing your time and expertise. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me.